I think we can officially start my first ever episode of uh, what I'm calling RG Academy. So welcome everyone to RG Academy, where I look at replays that you submit and we learn the game together. I think that's going to be the tagline. This is the first episode, so I'm, I'm pretty inexperienced in doing this sort of thing. So you'll have to bear with me. I might have a bunch of pauses and whatever, but uh, let's get right to it. Uh, in today's episode, I want to just talk about some beginner pitfalls, some common issues that a lot of beginner players have. Oh wait, one, one thing, one thing, one thing. Sorry. I'm actually going to mute the music. Uh, so for now, you'll just have to hear my slightly scratchy voice. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, I don't. I don't want this section to be muted on Twitch because I know they have their habit of doing that. So I'm just gonna completely mute the music altogether, and um, this way I can actually have the VOD be viewable later on. But yeah, let's get started. Uh, going back to the game. All right. So as I was saying. On this episode, I'm going to focus on some common beginner like pitfalls, things that uh, newer players might do that uh, aren't that very efficient or whatever, and uh, these are just ways that you can kind of improve your game. So let's just jump into the very first replay. I'm going to go into full screen mode, into the replay code. This is a replay submitted by Rhaegar is uh, currently player 2 against Dave the fight. Twitch will mute it anyways. Yeah, but I can submit a request for them to unmute it if that happens. Alright, so here we see a uh, base plus 5 game and all of the units are really cool. So we have like Doom Mech, we have Omega Splitter, we have Shiver Yeti, we have Lucina, and we have Cauterizer. So all these units are pretty high impact, except for maybe Shiver Yeti, but even Shiver Yeti is decent in the right situations. And uh, the first thing you want to do when you like enter a game is sort of look at the advanced set units and figure out a plan, figure out what you want to do. Uh, the reason I say look at the advanced set units is uh, the base set units are good, but usually uh, the base set is just sort of support for the advanced set. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the advanced set units aren't very impactful, they're just like wild drones and stuff, in which case uh, those games tend to devolve into like Tarsiers. But in most games you want to sort of mold your strategy around some of the strong advanced set units, because in general they are a bit stronger than the base set units. So like in this particular set, Omega Splitter is a very strong unit, it's a efficient attacker, and it's also a very efficient blocker. You can block for up to five points of damage every turn with it without it dying and and that's just an enormous amount of damage um we have cauterizer which is like just it's it's kind of like an efficient defender because you get four engineers with it and it also comes with three health but it's also a good way to put on pressure early in the game so uh a common a strategy that like a player can do is maybe go for like an early aggressive animus and then eventually get a bunch of tarsiers get like a blast forge, get a cauterizer out maybe, and then maybe just like start spamming tarsiers on walls or something. And you know, that's that'd be like a strategy. Another strategy would be just going all in on the blue, getting omega splitters, getting doom mechs, which are really efficient blockers because it has five and you can attack with it. Uh, the drawback is it dies after five turns, but on the turn that it dies, you can just leave it back to block. So you get like five free points of defense or something like that. But yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different routes to go, and uh, I will say ahead of time that the pitfall I'm trying to highlight in this particular game is uh, actually overteching. So what happens in this game is uh, Rhaegar actually kind of looks at all these cool units, and it's like, wow, look at all these things I can buy, and he tries to go for pretty much all of them. <laughs> and that, that is a bit of a problem, because as we'll see... Um, you want to you don't want to over tech you don't want to tech too much so uh the theme of this replay is over teching and by tech i should clarify i mean getting these structures the the other resources that aren't gold so uh conduit blastforge animus and let's just let's just go through the game so pretty standard opening drone 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 and here uh 
on second turn, green has the advantage of being able to get a natural conduit. However, uh, if you no notice, this set doesn't have any good green units. Which means the only thing the conduit's going to be able to buy is Gauss Cannon and Force Fields. And uh, Gauss Cannon's just really inefficient as an attacker in terms of its cost for attack, I guess. So uh, it's generally not a unit you want to spam. And Force Field is a very, very good blocker, but you kind of only want it mid to late game because it, it, it uh, requires you to lose a lot of drones in order to use. So uh, here... I mean, getting the conduit's not terrible, but uh, Rhaegar might want to consider waiting a bit and just saving the four gold in order to do something else, like maybe get an Animus into Tarsiers. Uh, Dave goes for Blastforge, and here Rhaegar goes for the Animus. He has to cut a drone to do so. If he didn't have the conduit, he'd be able to go like two drones into Animus, but uh, I mean, this is okay too. So uh, Animus is kind of the most aggressive tech, which means Rhaegar is trying to put on pressure. Uh, Dave just gets a Steel Splitter, which is nice. Uh, which is kind of like the only thing he can build from the Blast Forge right now. But uh, if you notice, Dave is kind of like just droning up, and uh, Rhaegar already cut a drone, and this turn he cuts two more drones, so uh, that's fine. It just means that Rhaegar is going to be the aggressive player, which means he needs to mount an attack and uh, force Dave to be using his extra resources to defend. And he gets a Rhino and a Tarsier. reason he gets the Rhino is the Steel Splitter could attack for one and kill an Engineer. So Rhino, Rhino makes the Steel Splitter not really able to attack. Uh, Dave goes for Animus and another Steel Splitter. Hagar gets a Tarsier and a Gauss Cannon. I actually think the Gauss Cannon should be a Tarsier. The reason being, uh, the most Rhaegar can attack for next turn is 3, which kills an Engineer. But uh, buying the Gauss Cannon just costs so so much gold for him. If he bought the Tarsier instead, he'd have 4 gold left at this point, which means he can get like an extra drone or maybe just save it up for later. Uh, in any case, uh, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, Dave gets the wall because uh, Rhaegar is starting to mount the pressure. And he actually makes a slight mistake here. Uh, he doesn't attack with the two Steel Splitters. So, Rhaegar at most can do 3 damage next turn, which can be blocked by an Engineer and a Wall. But uh, attacking with the Steel Splitters will just basically give Dave a free Engineer, since attacking for 2 damage, Rhaegar would be forced to block Engineer on top of Rhino. Uh, the game so far still looks pretty normal. But uh, we see Rhaegar goes for the Cauterizer, which is not a bad buy. Uh, the Cauterizer comes in with the extra Tarsier. And then suddenly he's threatening 3, 4, 6 damage. And that's pretty good. So Rhaegar is still playing the part of the aggressor. Dave gets a Shiver Yeti, just for defense actually. Uh, because uh, Rhaegar is doing 6 damage and he finally decides to attack with the Steel Splitters. Just spamming some Tarsiers, which are again just efficient attackers. So he, he snipes an Engineer here. Uh, Rhaegar attacks for 6. Gets a Shiver Yeti, which is okay. It freezes his Shiver Yeti, but as you'll see here, there's no way to defend without losing the Shiver Yeti, so he just loses the Shiver Yeti. Dave also just, you know, pretty standard. He's going Tarsiers. Uh, not really making use of the advanced set units, but uh, in general, Tarsier Rush is kind of always okay, I guess. And here's something interesting happens. Uh, Rhaegar's doing pretty good. He's doing 6 damage a turn, which is quite a bit of damage to be honest. He froze the Engineer, so um, there's no way for Dave to block efficiently. So like, uh, Rhaegar's doing 6 damage. If he still had the Engineer to block, what would happen is uh, Dave would lose the Engineer, and there'll be 5 damage left, so he'll lose a wall and then absorb 2 damage on the wall. But because Rhaegar froze the Engineer, uh, Dave is forced to lose either two walls or two steel splitters. I'm assuming he loses two walls. There's no way to uh, not lose two two walls, essentially, in this situation. That's where Freeze is really strong. You can kind of like surgically take apart your opponent's defense and make him lose more than he has to. And he Dave doesn't get to absorb any damage this turn, and that's really bad. But, oh, he actually loses a steel splitter. That's... In general, if it's a wall or a steel splitter, steel splitter is just strictly better than wall because it does one more damage. 
uh, it, because it has the option of doing one damage. Obviously, it costs a bit more, but once they're both on the field, you should always lose the walls before the steel splitters. But um, I guess the part that is weird is Rhaegar suddenly goes for two more blast forges, and uh, as we'll see here, he actually only makes thirteen gold. So he he won three blast forges because I believe he wanted to get an omega splitter, which is again a really really good unit. However, uh, this really puts him stretches him thin in terms of econ. A good rule of thumb to have in this game is you want your drone count your economy to kind of be able to support your technology, your your blast forges, animuses, and stuff like that. And uh, because like blues and reds go away at the end of every turn. Um, a good rule to go by is you want to be able to spend every blue and red resource you get every turn. Otherwise, there's some inefficiency in your build. You're kind of wasting resources. Now, this this won't be something that is always going to be good to follow. Uh, there's obviously exceptions where maybe you need the animus for something, but on most turns you'll just lose two red, or maybe you need a blast forge just to buy some specific unit and then you just waste the blue but uh, in general you don't want to have so much tech that uh, you can't afford to spend it all every turn green's different you can store green so having like just a conduit is okay in most cases but uh so i mean Rhaegar makes a slight miscalculation doesn't quite have enough gold for his omega splitter so he just buys another cauterizer which is okay it still puts on pressure uh, more damage, that sort of stuff. And he instead um, waits for next turn to get the Omega Splitter. And uh, Dave at this point is just still spamming Tarsiers. So we see here uh, Dave loses a bunch of stuff. He loses a Steel Splitter again. Again, he should lose the wall over the Steel Splitter, but minor mistake there. Um, and yeah, Rhaegar's actually applying quite a bit of pressure. He has 2 freeze, 11 attack, which means Dave actually has to leave behind most of his stuff. So Rhaegar's like, still in a good position. I do think the triple blast forge is quite inefficient, due to the fact that... Uh, due to the fact that uh, he kind of just will never be able to use 3 blue every turn, if, uh, if he doesn't get more drones. And especially with the Animus here. But here, here things start getting a bit weird. Uh, Rhaegar then goes for an Animus, and that's just, it's, it's very, very ambitious. Uh, I'm assuming what he intended to do was to get a Lucina. However, he's on 13 drones, and it's going to be almost impossible to save up enough money to get the Lucina and also have enough resources to defend uh, Dave's Tarsia rush here. And uh, we'll just see. Dave kind of buys a bunch of stuff. Only one cauterizer can attack, so Dave's actually kind of safe here. And actually, he's able to wipe out all the engineers, which means uh, Rhaegar is only going to be able to do uh, 9 damage if he does attack with Omega Splitter. But uh, here, here, let's look at Rhaegar's position. He has 14 gold. From his 13 drones and one gold left over. He has three blue and four red. With 14 gold, there is no way he can uh, actually spend all of his resources. So there's quite a bit of inefficiency here in terms of resources lost. Furthermore, uh, he doesn't have enough gold to get Lucina. So the second Animus ends up just not really doing anything. So let's look at what Rhaegar buys. He gets a Shiver Yeti, a Gauss Cannon, and then uh, passes the turn. But uh, let's see here. At this point, he's wasted three blue and three red resources. That's essentially the same thing as if he didn't have these blast forges and didn't have the second animus. So, so it's just very, very inefficient use of the resources. And um, as we'll see, uh, that resource use is actually going to unfortunately cost Rhaegar the game. Uh, Dave here went for the second blast forge. Which I believe is for Doom Max, yes. So he, he just gets Doom Max here. And uh, has just enough to defend. Again, the Cauterizer can't attack, so it's actually only 8 damage. 
And at this point, uh, if we actually look, Dave actually kind of leveled out on damage. Dave is doing 8 damage with his Tarsiers. Uh, Rhaegar is doing 8 damage with his... Uh, with his Tarsiers, Gauss Cannons, and Omega Splitter. Even, but Omega Splitter is going to be left back on defense. So uh, at, at this point, Dave is kind of caught up on damage. And the economies are about the same. But uh, Rhaegar keeps on buying Gauss Cannons. And again, uh, instead of the Gauss Cannons, a better buy would be to spend, spend his red. And if we look at the end of the turn again, we see that Rhaegar has 3 blue and 4 red that he didn't spend. So all of this tech is not really being utilized. But uh, if we just fast forward the game a bit, uh, Dave just goes with a pretty simple build of uh, going for Doom mechs at this point, which are decent. They apply quite a bit of pressure. And uh, Rhaegar is eventually just not really able to defend, so he has to like force field a lot. Uh, he loses a Mega Splitter and kind of just eventually crumbles to do Mech Offensive. And and really, what happened this game was again uh, rather than spending his resources on buying like either Econ or buying uh, Tech, I'm uh, sorry, Econ or buying like offensive units. Rhaegar actually invested a lot of his resources on just buying tech buildings that he didn't quite have the econ to support. So um, that is that is probably one of the biggest pitfalls for uh, newer players. You'll see like a Vance said, they'll be like, oh my god, so many cool units. Uh, I want to buy them all, but you really can't. So when you start a game, you kind of have to go and uh, exercise some discipline. You have to look at the Vance head and figure out what units you can afford to buy and what units you can't afford to buy. And in general, you want to uh, keep up your economy with your tech. And what I mean by that is if you have like a Blast Forge and an Animus and you want to spam two Tarsiers and a wall every turn, uh, a wall is 5 gold, two Tarsiers is 8 gold, that's 13 gold, that means that you should have 13 drones in order to support that. If you want to do just a really aggressive Animus all-in or something like that, you should have around like 10 drones uh, because you're eventually going to need Rhinos. Uh, 10 to 12 drones is really good if you're going for like a really, really aggressive Animus play. If you're going heavy into blue and you're going to get stuff like Omega Splitters, you'll want around like 14, maybe 16 drones. And if you're going really, really heavy Econ, if the set's just like a really slow set and and uh, you just kind of need to out econ the other person, you can go up to even 18, sometimes 20 drones. But uh, there is a trade-off here. The more drones you get, the less attack you can get. So if we look earlier at this game, before the crazy tech shenanigans, uh, Rhaegar's actually in a very, very good place. Because uh, he did cut a couple drones early, he was able to get more attack, which meant Dave had to... Uh, spend quite a bit of money on like walls and uh, Rhaegar actually has the advantage at this point so if you were to keep on spamming Tarsiers it would actually be a bit difficult for Dave to defend but yeah and uh, obvious is uh, said that you only needing to waste a single blue or red is fine and that's absolutely true. If you have just like one or two tech that you waste every turn, but you just want the option of being able to use the blue for like walls or something, then it's perfectly okay to get like a blast forge or something. But uh, the key takeaway from this game is you just really want to uh, cater your, you, you just want to like synchronize your economy and your tech so you can efficiently spend all of your tech every turn by attackers or whatever have you. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for Rhaegar for submitting the replay. Uh, you have the honor of being the very first replay of my very first episode. Alright, so done with uh, Rhaegar's game, with the teching, and now we're going to move on to a game submitted by A.C. Lemaire. I think that's how he wants me to pronounce the name. So, 
Uh, we have AC Lemaire again on player two, and he's playing against Lathe Q, something like that. And uh, in this replay, I'm going to talk about defensive efficiency and uh, how, uh, how to defend, maximize your defense. Uh, this is a replay where a really influential unit, Isochronus, is in the set. Isochronus is just kind of a, it, it's a fairly efficient attacker. It takes two turns to construct, but it does two damage uh, when it and when it finishes, and it can attack every other turn. So what you can do with Isochronus is you can kind of buy them every other turn, and you can synchronize them. So if you buy all ten, eventually the Isochronuses will just deal. 20 damage on one turn, and that's actually very, very difficult uh, for people to defend. So uh, it's a very strong unit, and it's a very influential unit, as we'll see in this game. There's also Synthesizer in the set, which is just kind of like an efficient way to get green. And it's a really cool unit, one of my favorite units. But uh, it, it's definitely more of a support unit than like a unit to focus your strategy around. And then we also see stuff like Frostbrooder, Perforator, and Protoplasm. So there's a possibility of going into like a red strategy, but as we'll uh, fast forward the game, we'll see Lathe decides to go for a really really early conduit, and uh, it's okay, but I don't I don't actually think it's that great in sets with Isochronus. The thing with Isochronus is you kind of need at least like 15 drones to support Isochronus. What happens is you'll get like a double ISOs or triple ISOs or something, but then on the off turns, you need to build other things, and uh, what most people do is they'll get like a blast forge, so they can spam walls on the off turn or something like that. And in general, you just want enough drones so that on the turn that you build your isochronous, you can get like three or four at once. So I don't think cutting drones that early is really that good. But uh, go through the game. Lathe decides to go with. Conduits and Blast Forges, AC Lemaire goes for the Synthesizer, both is okay. Uh, we'll see that actually the Synthesizer is a little bit too much green, and uh, AC Lemaire will have quite a bit left over, but it's not too bad because you can convert the green to blue and then buy like triple wall or like wall double steel splitter or something. So, uh, uh, AC Lemaire is actually the first one to get Isochronus. Notice that he has 15 drones. So see, so because Iso costs 5, he's able to just immediately get 3 Isochronuses. And that's pretty good. Uh, Lathe follows up with his set of Isochronus. Slightly delayed because, again, he cut the drone early. But, uh, again, not, not too big of a deal. As we notice, both players are in blue. Uh, AC Lemaire does go for an Animus, though. Which means uh, he's probably going to either be getting perforators, which are uh, efficient defenders, or frostbrooder, which is a good way to freeze walls and just uh, really wreak havoc on your opponent's defenses. However, uh, the critical point point of the game and the reason why I picked the replay is right here. Lathe decides to defend for exactly six damage. And what we'll see is uh, AC Lemaire is actually able to wipe out Lathe's entire off entire uh, defense. And uh, you never actually want this situation to happen. Uh, a lot of beginners will look at like the the attack and be like, okay, he's doing six damage. I have six defense. I'm safe. He can't kill anything. However, it's really important to uh, ab leave something back to absorb damage and. When, when Lath does this, he, losing his entire defense, suddenly he needs to spend a lot of his resources replacing his defense. So if we see here, he has to spend his entire turn almost just buying defense. He lost two drones here, had the double barrier, and then replaced the wall that he lost. Uh, which meant he couldn't do anything else on this turn. So... I'm just going to actually go into analysis mode and demonstrate what would have happened if uh, Lathe just had one more defense than attack. And and that is the general rule. Uh, when you see your opponent's attack, you want to have at least one more defense than opponent's attack. And you want to have one of your, at least one of your defenders have uh, not be fragile so it can absorb damage. 
So like a wall, for example, uh, unless you do three damage to it, the wall doesn't die. So it can so it can absorb up to two damage that your opponent does, and that's just two damage that sort of is wasted. The the two damage just uh, goes away. So it's always really good to absorb your damage on something like a wall. And uh, I think the replay loaded. And I just want to go back to the turn where he lost his defense here. So assuming he didn't do this, and he had the resources to defend, assuming he just bought like an extra barrier for example, right? what would have happened is uh, AC Lemaire would have, well, let's see what he actually does on his turn. I can uh, imitate the turn. Okay, he builds Iso double. We'll talk about that too. Uh, he goes for Isochronus and then two walls. Now, so we just gave Laith one more defense in this situation. So he actually saves his wall. So the difference here is he paid an extra gold and an extra green, but he got three health worth of defense back. So he he paid one one gold and one green for a wall almost. And that's just really, really efficient. So on this turn, his Isochronus is fire. And he's able to just get four ISOs uh, pretty effortlessly. And then he does his damage. And I believe uh, AC Lemaire actually defended like this. So AC Lemaire goes a Frostbooter here, and we'll, we'll talk about these plays a little later on, uh, but for now I just want to show, so um, this is the turn, that uh, turn 9, that Laith had to go wall, barrier, barrier, force field, force field. The force fields require sacrificing drones, so he lost to economy here, and uh, he's, he is able to defend, but it cost him all of his green and uh, two points of gold in his economy. But uh, if he had a wall, for example, uh, he can still buy another wall, and then he can just buy a force field and a barrier to defend. So this means that he saves two green and one point of economy. Alternately, if he doesn't care that much about the green, he can actually just buy three barriers. So uh, in the short term, it costs a bit more. It costs one more gold, since you're buying three barriers as a barrier force field. But uh, he's able to preserve all of his drones, which are going to be very useful later on. So he's able to kind of defend pretty effortlessly if he does this. And furthermore, he still has 9 gold to spend. Whereas um, in this, well, I guess he buys the Animus. Uh, he still has 3 more gold to spend, whereas in this case he only has 1. So uh, saving the wall just makes this defensive turn much, much more efficient for Lath. And regardless of what happens, uh, every turn he's just going to get 2 more gold. Whereas here, he's only able to get 15 gold. Every turn here, he's going to be getting 17 gold. And sort of the effects of having efficient defense early just propagates throughout the rest of the game. He'll have more gold to spend on stuff. He'll be able to get more isochronuses. He'll be able to get more defense on later turns. Uh, these drones can be used for force fields later on, for example. And etc. So it's just really, really important to... Uh, Defend for one more than an attack and absorb everything on something like a wall. Alright, let's go back to where. I, I am like not quite keeping up with chat as much because I'm kind of just like lecturing on. But uh, TV P Pimba asks Is there a possibility not to use music which mutes my VODs? Uh, I'll try not to. Uh, I'm, I'm. I think it's a pendulum that's causing my mods, my uh, videos to mute. So I'll, I'll try to remove some of the music. Uh, if you notice in this particular segment, I'm not using any music because I don't want this muted. Anyways, um, Lath builds two force fields, double barrier, uh, uses up both most of his resources. Oh wait, 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 wait! I wanted to talk about it a little bit earlier. So, um. Still going on the theme of defensive efficiency, uh, we see AC Lemaire on this turn that he uh, is able to kill Lath's defenses. Rather than going for something like uh, two Isochronus or two Isochronus and a wall or something, right? In this turn, uh, what, what turn is it? 
So rather than going for like double isochronous and wall, which would be enough to defend, what AC Lemaire does is he actually converts his his green into blue and then goes for a single isochronous and one wall. And this is actually pretty inefficient. I said that you want to defend for one more than your opponent's attack, but on the flip side, you also don't want to overbuild on defense. And the reason for this is the extra points of defense won't actually be used. If he didn't go for the wall, he'd have exactly enough defense to uh, defend Lathe's next attack. And that means that he'll be able to use the rest of the, his resources on more goal. Uh, sorry, on more offense. And offense will cause your opponent to have to spend more resources on defense. So it's this kind of cycle. Uh, every point of attack you build forces your opponent to, to buy one point of defense. So in, in most games, you just if you can get away with buying more attack, you always want to buy more attack uh, in, ter in place of defense or something like this. And uh, I think the reason AC Lemaire actually does this is we'll see that he defends like this. He's trying to preserve his engineers. And um, engineers in the early game are really good because they let you buy drones. But in the middle of the game, you actually don't really want to buy drones. Uh, if, you, if you buy too much econ, that's also attack that you aren't buying. And attack you're not buying is a is attack that your opponent doesn't have to defend, which means your opponent has more uh, leeway to buy his attack and kind of snowball the game. So in this sort of situation, rather than defending on the walls, what you want to do is quite simply... Oh, right. Uh... Uh, quite simply, you want to just lose the two engineers and get full absorb efficiency on the wall. Uh, because he's doing 7 damage, you'll notice that the wall only absorbs... Oh no, I don't want to do that. The wall only absorbs 1 damage. Uh, whereas if you lost the engineers, uh, you can absorb 2 damage. So it's like, it's like you gain 1 extra point of health, right? If we look at this situation... He has three points of health on the wall and then two points of health from the engineer. Look at this situation, he just has two walls. So this is six points of health here, this is five points of health. Uh, every point you absorb is one extra point of health you have uh, on your defense, which means you have to buy less defense in future turns. And uh, it's okay to lose the engineer because honestly you can just replace the engineers later on. Like this, for example. You can get like a steel splitter, or I don't know. I guess he did build the red, so perforators. And, you know, uh, you're kind of in the same position you were in. You have two engineers, and the only difference is you just have one more point of defense in the wall. So, it, it's, it's, you don't need to be afraid to lose your engineers, but uh, you do want to replace them. If you don't replace your engineers, what happens is... Uh, your opponent can attack for multiples of three and then just kill your stuff, as I showed earlier in the Rhaegar game. So, uh, we'll see actually, because AC Lemaire doesn't do that, it, it actually does kind of cost him a bit in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, having to spend more resources on defense. He does do an interesting thing, he buys a Frostbooter, and Frostbooter is generally pretty good because against blue, because Frostbites freeze for three, and walls just happen to have three health. However, um, he is against Isochronus, and uh, the problem here is uh, the Brooder is a bit slow, and he will be able to freeze the walls, but even if he breaches, he's not going to be able to kill the Isochronus, really. So I don't actually like the Frost Brooder that much here. It's not terrible, you can still breach and kill drones and stuff and do a lot of damage, but uh, it's just not quite as good in uh, Isochronus mirrors as in other situations because of how high health the Isochronus units act are. Uh, anyways, go on. Lathe does his defense. Also gets the Animus. And I, I will add that actually I think getting the Animus is good, but the reasoning for me to get an Animus was I, I would actually want to be building Perforators. And Perforators are really, really nice because they're actually more cost efficient on defense than walls. Uh, the drawback is they don't have prompts, so you have to buy them one turn earlier. But if we look at the perforator, 
Uh, two perforators would cost six and uh, two red, but it'll defend for four. And uh, AC the Mayor ha definitely has enough drones to go for perforators, since he's only buying the ISOs every other turn. So you can buy like a wall and then two perforators, and um, perforators, two of them will defend for four. For one gold extra, you get one extra point of defense. That's really, really good. But anyways, uh, Laith just goes for more ISOs here. And he also gets a Frostbooter. Uh, here he finally loses his engineers. Uh, AC Lemaire loses his engineers to prevent him from losing a wall. Fine. And uh, he gets a Protoplasm, which uh, also I don't I think is a bit questionable. And the reason I think it's questionable is um, Protoplasm is actually not very damage efficient. Look at the unit. It does four damage, and it can block, which is very nice. But uh, it costs seven green, green, red, red, and that's quite a bit of uh, tech investment and also gold investment for something that goes away. Instead of buying the protoplasm, for example, uh, you can just save the gold, which would be seven gold or something, and then buy like two isochronus on the following turn. And uh, two isochronus does four damage. Two turns from now, obviously, but it'll, it'll keep on doing two damage until the end of the game, whereas the protoplasm. Sorry, it'll keep on doing 4 damage till the end of the game, whereas the Protoplasm just dies immediately. So I, I don't really like the Protoplasm purchase, especially in these um, Isochronus Mirrors, where you really kind of have to think in terms of long-term damage efficiency and also how to defend the most efficient way. And uh, another issue with Protoplasm is you don't actually get to absorb any damage. If you say lose your two walls over the Protoplasm, suddenly you don't have any more defense. It's as if you didn't absorb any, it is, you, you basically don't absorb any damage, so you just lose your entire defense and has to, and you have to replace it every, every turn. Anyways, um, we'll see that he does pop the protoplasm here after freezing the walls, so uh, you don't get any defensive value out of the protoplasm, so you just paid 7 green green red red for essentially 4 gauss charges, which is something that would cost 4 and 4 green. Uh, so not quite the most efficient way to use it, but it does breach, which is nice, and he's able to kill a bunch of drones, and also the Frostbooter. And, uh, AC Lemaire is able to defend with his walls, but at this point he's kind of out of walls, and, uh, however, something really interesting happens. I think Laith actually just resigns the game here, because he sees 16 points of damage and 6 freeze, which means it's actually around 22 points of damage, so he's going to get breached for 10 damage, essentially. Um, I don't actually think Laith should resign here. I think the game is still ongoing, and uh, Laith actually has a pretty decent chance of winning. And the reason I say that is because um, if we look at just the damage numbers, uh, Laith has 10 Isochronus and a Gauss Cannon. AC Lemaire has six, uh, 5 Isochronus and 2 Gauss Cannons. I'm not counting Protoplasm because it's not consistent damage, again. But uh, Laith is almost doing double the damage of AC Lemaire, which means on the next swing of the Isochronus, uh, AC Lemaire will actually have a very, very difficult time defending, especially if he's buying stuff like uh, Protoplasm. So uh, it would be a close game, obviously, because uh, Laith will lose his entire economy on, on this breach, but I do think there is still a game to be played. Uh, at any rate, uh, this is where the replay does end. So uh, the key I wanted to note was on the early turns when Laith lost all of his defense, and then also uh, not being afraid to lose engineers in order to defend efficiently. Uh, it, if uh, AC Lemaire just decided to uh, lose the engineers and then buy the wall, he would have at least one more Isochronus. And uh, in general, I think uh, for AC Lemaire, uh, sorry, ow my ears, what happened? <laughs> did I, uh, did I, is the mic like popping or something? I apologize if it is. But yeah, uh, if 
if AC and the mayor, uh, rather than going for cutesy like protoplasm plays, I think my recommendation to him would be just keep on spamming Isochronus. You already breached his defense once. You already you are already cost cost costing him quite a bit of resources just defending. So if you're just able to keep on the pressure and just consistently buy Isochronus, uh, you should be able to win the game because of the critical breach early. So yeah, uh, that's it for this replay. Those are the takeaways. Uh, make sure you try to defend as efficiently as possible, absorbing the max amount of damage every turn. Uh, there are exceptions. Sometimes you do want to save your engineers or something. Uh, most of the times you don't, though. And also, uh, make sure to buy efficient attackers. Uh, Protoplasm is just not really that efficient of an attacker. And, uh, yeah. Will I be talking about defending with finesse? Uh, yeah, I will. Not this episode, but in future episodes, I'll probably dedicate an entire episode or two to talking about the best way to defend efficiently and how to force your opponent not to defend efficiently and why it's important to keep on buying engineers so you can defend efficiently, etc., etc. But uh, for now, I'm just going to kind of briefly go over all the pitfalls. So, yeah. Uh, I have one more replay for us today. And uh, it's one submitted by uh, Shivio, who is currently in chat right now. So this is her replay. And uh, in this game, I want to talk about cutting drones early versus not cutting drones, and also sort of the trade-off there that you, you, you have. And uh, we'll just start the game. So Shivio goes double drone here. And I guess I should mention, in, in this set, we have Trinity Drone, we have Fission Turret, and we have Frostbrooder. So there's like aggressive options in terms of Fission Turret and Frostbrooder. And there's also sort of like these defensive options you have, where you can go like Trinity Drones into Doom Walls, into like Odin or something like that. And uh, if you do go the aggressive route, you also have access to Protoplasm. So I was saying earlier how it's not very good. Uh, in terms of attack efficiency. It is, however, very good if you're like doing something super, super aggressive, and you just need to defend for 3 damage on this turn. And on the following turn, you're threatening 4 damage. So if you're if you're doing like a really, really aggressive build, Protoplasm is actually quite a nice unit, uh, since it lets you defend and immediately counterattack. Anyways, uh, we'll see... Ash Vio? Okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, correction on the name, it's Ashvio instead of Ashivio, which doesn't make sense anyways because there's no I after the H, so it's Ashvio. Uh, here Ashvio does something a bit interesting. He cuts a drone to go for a conduit. And um, the way I look at this play is this. If you're cutting, if you're sacrificing early, def uh, early economy, and I guess I should clarify, what I mean by cut a drone is instead of buying two drones here, he kind of uh, sacrifices one drone in order to get an early tech structure. But uh, if you're cutting drones early, you want to be doing an aggressive strategy. Uh, otherwise, it's almost always better to keep on droning in order, in order to uh, have a strong economy. If you, if you have less drones than your opponent, you have to have more attack. If your opponent has both more attack and also more drones than you, you're probably going to lose the game, unless you're using some weird strategy with uh, units like Zamora or something, where suddenly you have a turn where you swing the game. But in general, um, uh, cutting drones means signals that you're going for an aggressive strategy. However, in this game we see that uh, Ashbio actually suddenly goes for a Trinity drone and an Animus. So uh, he cut another drone for Animus here, and uh, he's still kind of on track for aggressive strategy. He can go like Frostbrooder into a Fission Turret or something like that. But if we uh, continue on this game, we see that rather than uh, just all out bum rushing Tarsiers or Fission Turrets or Frostbrooders or something, Ashvio, Ashvio decides to go for a drone and a Trinity drone. So he cut two drones early, and then later on now he's actually continuing to drone. And um, I'm just going to fast forward a bit. He gets a Blast Forge here, gets a Frost Brooder, and he's continuing to drone. He's he, he got two drones, two drones, two drones, and then two more drones. 
and on turn 6, we see that he's, th he's threatening 1 point of damage, and he has like 7 plus, plus 9, uh, 15 economy. So uh, he cut drones early, but didn't really do an aggressive strategy. So he's kind of like half and half. He, he got a couple attackers, Tarsier, Fission Turret, and he kind of decided to catch up on his economy. I'm just going to actually do an analysis right here. I'm going to show you uh, two, two different ways to play this. I'm going to first just not cut any econ. I'm not going to cut drones early. I'm just going to go pure econ. And uh, if this replay loads, it's going to take a while. And, and then I'm going to show you what happens if I do decide to cut the drone and then go for like an offensive strategy. And uh, we're actually going to play the game until turn 6. And I just kind of want to show what my board state would look like uh, if I play committing to the offensive strategy versus committing to the econ economic strategy. And, and what the board state looks like uh, when you kind of do half and half. Sorry guys, uh, the uh, for some reason sometimes replays just take a really not replays analysis mode just takes a really long time to load. Uh, in the meantime, I guess we can take some questions. So while we're watching this beautiful loading animation that reached the front page of Reddit, I might add. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions so far about uh, what I'm doing? Uh, I'm also, if you have any criticisms or suggestions or anything like that, uh, please feel free to also type that into chat. And uh, I'll admit I haven't really been reading chat, so if you said anything earlier, I probably missed it, so just type it again. <laughs> uh, what's up with all the loading? I don't know. <laughs> when is Trinity Drone good besides Dead Eyes? Uh, if we look at the unit Trinity Drone, it's kind of just like a one gold cheaper drone. Obviously, it costs the green, but uh, occasionally, if you just want to econ up, a Trinity drone kind of will save you gold in the long run, so you can use the gold to buy other stuff. Uh, sometimes, like you can, if you go double drone, you only have five gold and you can't buy Animus. But if you go like drone Trinity drone, you can buy an Animus because you save one gold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just kind of like a more quote unquote efficient drone. Uh, in terms of cost, at the cost of forcing you to buy a conduit. Uh, but usually buying a conduit is not a bad idea anyways because you want force. So in uh, certain high econ games, it's nice to go Trinity Drone. And obviously, as you stated, it's good against Dead Eyes. Uh, Subcom Freak asks, is Zamora any good? And uh, yes, Zamora is actually a very, very strong unit. And I'm going to try to find a replay of Zamora. Actually, I don't think I played any Zamora games recently, so maybe I won't. Um, but uh, the reason Zamora is good is you can kind of like buy the Zamora early and then just uh, econ up, uh, buy conduits, and then buy defensive units. So if there's like really good defense in the set, Zamora is generally a good unit because you can kind of turtle up until the turn Zamora fires. And uh, if you're able to successfully survive your opponent's onslaught and get your Zamora to fire more than once, usually you'll win the game because it's just such a huge tempo swing. Uh, Zamora gives you 8 extra gold and also does 8 damage. Uh, however, Zamora is weak if there's really aggressive attackers in the set and not a lot of good defense. So if you buy a Zamora and your opponent realizes you, you bought the Zamora, what your opponent can do is he can just like rush you and just like kill you straight off before you have any chance to fire the Zamora, or um, like completely kill your economy. So even if you can follow the fire the Zamora, you're already way too far behind. So generally, it's kind of like a judgment call. You have to buy Zamora in games where you are confident you'll be able to defend your opponent. And that is the correct way to play against Zamora. If your opponent buys a Zamora, you want to just do the most aggressive thing possible so you can, uh, so you can basically kill him before his Zamora becomes relevant. Uh, rushing second Zamora usually doesn't work, but occasionally occasionally it does work. So if he, your opponent buys a Zamora, 
and you buy the Zamora the turn immediately following, in certain situations it's okay. But again, beat Zamora, you want a very fast attack. However, if there's enough good defense in the set, Zamora is often a very powerful unit that can win the game. Got some questions here. How many people in the beta? I think it's in the thousands right now. And how long have I been in it? I've been uh, playing this game for about a month and a half. I still. Oh my god, this is gonna take a while. So let's let's just continue the Q and A. Should you tech hard into green with Zamora? Yes, you should. Uh, you need to. You don't need to tech hard too early. Ideally, you want eight green on the turn Zamora attacks, since it costs eight green, and you just want to uh, buy conduits on a need basis, so you'll always have eights on the turn Zamora attacks. So eventually, you will have like eight conduits, but you don't have to get them immediately. Uh, you can get them slowly, just as long as you have enough for Zamora to attack every turn. Uh, let's. See. Better to go first, not necessarily. Uh, if we just look at like normal games, look at this replay. We're just using the replay here. Uh, player one has a huge tempo advantage because uh, he gets to do the first thing. He gets to buy the first tech structure usually. Uh, however, player two actually has an econ advantage because he starts with one more drone, and this econ advantage. It's actually really interesting because on turn two, player one, player two is actually able to get a conduit, and in certain sets that's very good. Like if there's Isochronus in the set, for example, uh, getting the early conduit means you can kind of uh, actually get a tempo advantage in certain games where uh, both players will want to be going green. However, if like the set doesn't have any good green units, what usually happens is player one can go. On turn three, double drone into Glassforge or Animus, and in either case, it kind of forces player two on defense because player one will always be able to get the first attacking unit. So like, this forces player two to buy a Glassforge. I'm just like playing really quickly, but you see like his his Tarsiers will be attacking first, uh, which is like a pretty big inequality in the game. Uh, even though you're able to get the wall, in general, like player one just gets kind of a pretty big tempo advantage uh, by getting the first attack. In this situation, player two is actually not in a bad spot at all because uh, he got the first blast forge, which is good against Tarsiers. But if there's not, like, if there's units that are scarier than Tarsiers in the set, uh, sometimes player one will just be the first person to be able to buy said scary units and uh, kill you with it. So that is player 1's advantage, but player 2 does have the econ advantage, and in certain games, you'll be able to squeeze out units maybe even faster than player 1. So it's kind of a coin flip. Uh, both sides have their advantages, definitely. And uh, a cool thing I do want to show you is, I did say like player 1 is able to get Animus first. However, uh, actually, assuming, uh, assuming player 2 wants to rush, you can actually cut a drone and be the first player to get the Animus. So, uh, remember turn 3 was the turn that player 1 was able to get the Animus. But I can actually get the Animus for player 2 on turn 2 if I sacrifice my economy. So there, there is this trade-off here. Player 2 can be the aggressive player uh, by sacrificing his economic advantage. Right? He starts the game with 7 drones, but he can he can kind of switch the status quo and become the aggressive tempo player by sacrificing the economic advantage. And in this case, player 2 will be the first one to get Tarsiers, and you know, the game can progress from this point. But yeah, so, so in certain circumstances, player 2 can do that if uh, the set is sufficiently aggressive, for example. And if you if we see here, if player 1 decides to just preempt player 2 and go for the early Animus, at, at some point, you just sacrifice way too much economy. And it's not worth it. Player 2, at this point, can kind of defend with just a Blast Forge. And then uh, just win with his superior economy. So there is there is a fine line of how much economy you can sacrifice uh, to go aggressive.
Uh, Ashivio has a game where he rushed down a Zamora. Sure, let's look into. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. The game finally loaded, guys. So uh, we, we'll continue doing question and answer uh, later on. Uh, but uh, for first, we're going to finish this replay. Oh, and I also should mention that I will be doing a beta key giveaway at the end of the stream if there are people who still don't have beta keys and want them. So uh, please stay tuned for that if that is what you're looking for. So uh, where is it? I want to go to turn six. So this is the game state we're going to compare. This is uh, Ashvio's turn six. And uh, I'm going to just go back to the start. So let's say uh, I'm actually only going to play for Ashvio in the first case. Uh, let's say we just want to go Econ, right? So rather than going uh, Drone Conduit, like in the replay, what we can do is go Drone Drone. And in the following turn, we can go Drone Drone Conduit. We're on turn 3. And then we can go Drone, Trinity Drone, and Animus or something like that. Turn 4. And on turn 5, we can go Drone, Trinity Drone, and get like 2 Tarsiers, for example. And on turn 6, we can go Drone... Trinity Drone, two more Tarsiers. So uh, let's look at the game state here. Uh, in in this version of the game, where I went with like a very very high econ build, uh, we see that we have nine drones and three Trinity Drones. So uh, three Trinity Drones is nine gold, and the nine drones is nine gold. Nine plus nine, eighteen. Uh, Ash Vio has eighteen gold worth of drones. And he's able to get uh, four Tarsiers on the board. Only two Tarsiers will be attacking the next turn. But uh, he has four attackers and uh, 18 points of 18 gold worth of econ. Uh, in the in the Ashvio replay, we see that he has seven drones here, and then uh, nine nine gold worth of Trinity drones, which is around what is it? That's 16. So he has actually two less econ than in uh, my replay, but he also has way less attack. He did go for the Frostbrooder, right? And we can go Frostbrooder too. I mean, we don't have to go double Tarsier. We can go, for example, Frostbrooder, Drone, Trinity Drone. And on the next turn, we can go double Tarsier. We can even go Fission Turret if we want and just get double Drone. And then we have enough to buy Blast Forge, but we have a lot of options here. And uh, in this game state versus this game state, we can see that even though he does like one damage early on turn six, uh, the opponent has a wall, so the the single Tarsier doesn't actually affect much of anything. Uh, versus, and he's able to get like two damage on the board next turn with the fission turret, so he kind of stunts his damage a little by going for the early uh, early aggressive play of cutting a drone into uh, suddenly buying more econ. Whereas in my game state, I have a uh, slightly better econ, but I also am very well set up to continue uh, pushing damage. In this sort of game state, I can even go like for a second Animus if I want to go really aggressive. And like, I can go like just infinite Tarsiers or something like that, for example, uh, because I have the econ to support it. So uh, that is sort of like the econ option. If you uh, don't cut drones, you can go for just a healthy econ and then uh, move there. Uh, now I want to look at the other option, uh, staying more true to the replay. Uh, here I'm actually going to play for his opponent also, because uh, what his opponent does is going to be relevant. Uh, Ashvio in the game went drone conduit, so I'm I'm going to go drone conduit, but instead of uh, sort of switching back to uh, getting econ, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just build aggressive units, stay on some really low drone count, and then see what happens. Sorry guys, uh, game wasn't full screen. but uh, So I'm going to play for... Gre actually, I'm going to need to switch back and forth to see what Gregarious does, but he goes for Conduit on turn 2, and here Ashvio can go for like a Fission Turret. And then uh, if we want to go like super crazy aggressive, we can actually go for Animus here. Uh, we don't have to though. We can always go for a double drone after the fission turret. But let's let's go like super super aggressive just to show the two extremes. So Animus here, 
And I don't really recommend this. I think this is, uh, in general, a little too aggressive. You want, like, more drums than this, usually. But Regaris will buy, like, Drone, Trinity Drone, Blast Forge, probably. And uh, you can go for, like, a Frost Brooder, a Drone, a Trinity Drone here. Get a kill an engineer. You can buy a wall, drone, and a single drone because he actually only has one engineer. So you already got some value by going aggressive. You killed an engineer. So it prevents your opponent from droning. If he wants to continue droning heavily, he's going to have to get more engineers. But uh, we can just get like far seers here. And the opponent will be able to do something. Steel Splitter, uh, probably Gauss Cannon or something, I don't know. Just some random amount of units or maybe Fission Turret. But uh, in this situation, we get a Rhino, a Tarsier, and we can get a Fission Turret. So we're still on turn 6, and uh, let's, look at, let's look at the damage here. Uh, on Ashfield's turn 6, we see, again, 2 damage. Uh, in this sort of super, super aggressive play, uh, we have much less Econ. We're only on 12 drones versus uh, Ashvio's uh, 16, so we're 4 Econ less. However, we have uh, Tarsiers, we have Fission Turrets, we have Rhinos, we have just like, what's this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 points of damage on board, and a slightly faster Frostbrooder. The Frostbrooder was bought one turn sooner, so we actually have 2 Frostbites instead of the 1. And in general, we're just in a, a position to kind of really pressure our opponent. And um, here we're threatening six points of freeze, which means uh, the opponent will actually have to buy a wall just so uh, Frostbites don't breach. And he still has to buy like a force field or something. Uh, six plus five is 11, so the force field would be enough. But he's going to have to spend like all of his resources buying defense and then if we freeze the walls obviously we can't breach so we don't freeze but uh, i mean just looking at this sort of position we're in we're in like better shape to uh threaten our opponent than uh if we just kind of half and half it i guess in any case uh this is not what happens game so uh, let's just go back to the replay and i just i just wanted to show like two pads to take in this game essentially and in my opinion, I think going slightly higher econ was better. I, I don't like the super, super aggressive path. But uh, if we continue the game... Yeah, Ashfield does pull out the win in this one. Uh, due to the fact that he actually is able to assemble quite a good econ. But I just wanted to show that it's he's able he would be able to assemble more econ earlier if he... Uh, went the more aggressive route, or he could go the slightly more defensive route and still have a decent economy. But even with the inefficiencies, I'm just going to kind of go over this game really quickly. Uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, both players kind of drone heavily for, for quite a bit. We see quite a few tr Trinity drones. And uh, his opponent's actually able to get an Odin here, which is kind of scary. But uh, we'll see that... Actually, the Frost Brooders just apply a ton of pressure. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Ashville is threatening like 22 points of effective damage, which is really scary. Uh, the, the the Frostbites can freeze walls and steel spitters and stuff, and then and then uh, Ashville can like snipe the Odin or snipe the drones or whatever. So. Uh, Gregaris actually has to leave back Steel Splitters to defend, just so he doesn't get overwhelmed by the Frostbites. And here, Ashfield can actually breach still, but uh, he can't really kill anything, so he chooses to leave the Frostbites back. Ideally, Ashfield would want to like kill the Odin or something. So if we just continue on this game, we'll see like Gregaris has to spend his entire turn buying Doom Walls. So this is just the Frost Rooter being really, really scary and applying a lot of pressure. It forces the opponent in sort of an awkward spot. And we'll also notice that uh, Gregarius doesn't have any Tarsiers, so he doesn't have any efficient attackers, really. Uh, Steel Splitters aren't that efficient, and even Odin itself is kind of inefficient, because to attack, it has to sacrifice the Steel Splitter. 
So you're actually paying uh, six and a blue to deal four damage. And that's, in the long term, that's pretty inefficient. In the short term, though, obviously, it does apply quite a bit of pressure. Uh, but a Ashbeal buys Tarsiers, which are just a super efficient unit. And that's why, eventually in this game, uh, Ashbeal is able to grind out Gregaris. Actually is able to buy an Odin of his own at this point, because uh, Gregaris spent a lot of turns attacking with his Odin, so he, he actually just doesn't have that much attack anymore. At any rate, uh, eventually Gregaris crumbles. Uh, the Frostbites were used to breach a little earlier on. And yeah, in this position, uh, Ashville just has more stuff and more attack and more of everything. So. Eventually, uh, Ashfield is able to snipe the Odin. Uh, Gregarious is using Protoplasm for defense. In terms of cost, it's actually very inefficient defense. You're paying quite a bit of tech for just four defense, but he's out of drones, so he can't buy force fields. So he's kind of forced into this awkward situation where he has to buy Protoplasms for defense. Uh, in any case, uh, Ashfield gets up his Frostbites again, and he's able to breach, kill the Odin. And that's the end of the game. So yeah, uh, well played by Ashbeal. Uh, this is the efficiency of Tarsiers at work versus something like Steel Splitters and Gauss Cannons. But I did want to mention uh, the the big takeaway for this game is that you only want to cut drones if you're going offensive. And if you, you're not going offensive, then it's almost always better to just econ up to a reasonable amount of drones and then start building attack or something like that. And uh, that's actually all the replays I have today. And uh, the three or four beginner pitfalls, uh, just to quickly go over them. In the first game, we saw a game where Rhaegar went very, very heavy on, tack, on, on tech. But didn't have the economy to really spend all that tech every turn. So uh, his build was just a bit too inefficient. So his opponent was able to kind of just overwhelm him with Doom Drone Parseers. So you should always uh, make sure you have roughly the same amount of tech as you have Econ. So you're able to spend your tech every turn. And the one exception to that, of course, is Conduits, which uh, you can kind of save up. So you don't have to spend your green every turn. But you definitely want to try to spend your blue or red if you can. Uh, in the second game, we saw uh, defensive inefficiencies. Um, uh, one of the players defended for exactly the amount of attack of the other player, which meant he lost his entire defense, and that forced him to bend his drones to buy force fields in order to defend the next attack. Uh, you always want to defend for one more than your opponent is attacking for. On the flip side, uh, his opponent. Uh, actually over defended. He bought an extra wall when he didn't need to. So, so um, the other rule is you don't want to over defend if you don't have to. You want to defend for just enough and spend all of your remaining resources buying attack. Attack always pays off in the long run. Uh, one extra point of damage you're doing is one point of damage your opponent uh, needs to defend. And defense is expensive. If we look at engineer, it defends for one and it costs two gold. So. Uh, obviously wall is slightly more efficient and there are more efficient defenders, but as a rough rule, a point of damage uh, forces your opponent to like spend a gold and a half or even two gold every turn buying defense. And uh, that's every single turn. So uh, the more attack you have, the more you force your opponent to spend his economy defending instead of buying attack. And it kind of snowballs from there. The less attack he has, the more gold you have to buy, continue buying attack, etc, etc, etc. You always want to defend efficiently, but you don't want to over defend. Anyways, uh, moving on to the third game, uh, we saw a game where Ashfield uh, cut, cut drones in order to kind of go aggressive, but rather than going aggressive, he continued to drone. So uh, the takeaway there is um, there is a definite trade-off where you want to stop droning in order to uh, start building attack. But 
you want to sort of, uh, if you commit to stop droning early, you need to apply pressure because your opponent will be continuing to drone, so he'll have a better economy. Uh, and uh, if you do decide to go aggressive, generally you don't want to continue to drone. So if you like cut drones to buy a really early Animus or something like that, you don't want to suddenly go double Tarsier and then buy two drones and a Tarsier. You want to continue to uh, play a low econ game and just apply pressure to your opponent by putting more attack on the board. Um, rule of thumb, if your opponent has more damage and more economy than you, you're probably losing the game because he's just going to be ahead on all fronts. However, uh, if you have more attack and your opponent has more economy, then it's unclear who's going to win, and vice versa. If you have more economy and your opponent has more attack, it's still kind of unclear. There's a there's kind of a transition point where you want to stop buying drones and start buying attack, and uh, that's kind of one of the difficulties of the game. You really have to figure out when you should be transitioning into buying attack versus uh, econ. And uh, yeah, the only way to really learn that is to play more games, I guess. And I guess the last thing I want to say is uh, a common question I get is how many drones should you have every game? You know, how many drones is good? And I did sort of answer it earlier, but I want to kind of make it a bit more explicit. If you are going a really aggressive red strategy, where you go an early Animus into Tarsiers or other stuff like Grimbotches, Electrovores, Frostbooters, uh, a good rule of thumb is you want somewhere around 10 to 12 drones. Uh, sometimes you can get away with 9, uh, sometimes you want maybe 14, but uh, 10 to 12 is good if you're going for like a mono red strategy. Uh, if you're going for sort of a mid-rangey like blue strategy, where you're getting blue and then maybe you transition to red, or maybe you get blue and green, uh, a good place to be is anywhere from like 14 to 18 drones. Um, that's just about how much econ you'll need to be able to afford the stuff you can buy in green and blue. And uh, occasionally you'll be going, this is much, much rarer, but um, occasionally you'll have a set where there's just not many good strong attackers, in which case you can kind of justify buying even upwards of 20 drones. And these sort of games are going to be very heavy on defense. So uh, you'll do stuff like maybe Russian Odin, or maybe maybe there's just like no attackers in the set, uh, but like there's really good defenders like Defense Grid or Energy Matrix. Uh, so sometimes in these games you'll be sort of just really rushing econ and then eventually assembling attack, because if your opponent just tries to rush you and there's like Energy Matrix in the set, then you could defend really easily and then just beat your opponent with your higher economy. So. Uh, these ga those games don't really happen that often, but in general, you want to stay around like 14 to 20 drones. Uh, 20 is kind of high, 14 is kind of low, so somewhere in the middle. And yeah, just use your drones efficiently, uh, use your resources efficiently, don't overbuy tech. And uh, everything about this game is efficiency at the end of the day. And also how to defend burst damage, I guess. <laughs> Units you know, like Scorchilla, I guess, aren't really that efficient. But yeah, that's that's it. I'm I'm starting to ramble, so <laughs> I think I'm done. Uh, that is it for the actual episode. Uh, thank you so much for the three people who have submitted replays. At this point, I will continue to do my Q and A. So if you guys have any questions, I'll uh, I'll continue answering them. And while we're doing the Q and A, I'm gonna start with the beta key raffle. So if you still don't have a beta key, or maybe you want a beta key for your friend or something like that, uh, just type exclamation point raffle to join the raffle, and uh, you'll have a chance of winning a beta key. And all right, fire away with the questions. Of raffle entrance. Any questions too, guys? Any questions? <laughs> I 
I think I was a bit too rambly this episode, but uh, in the future episodes, I'll try to keep it concise and really get down to the point. It's just this one. I don't think I quite prepared as much as I should have, so apologies for that. Um, might as well talk about the next episode. On, on the next episode, I want to theme it on um, how to really approach the start of the game, how to look at the random set and decide on your strategy. Uh, when you when you're when you're starting the game and you see all the random set units, you really want to kind of focus your strategy on those units. So uh, I, I'm gonna need replays where we have like interesting decisions you can make at the start of the game in terms of like tech decisions or maybe just really cool synergies in the random set units. So if you guys have interesting replays like that or just interesting replays in general, please uh, do submit them. Uh, you can PM me on Twitch. You can PM me on Reddit. Or you can post in a thread about uh, this episode, your replay submissions. And yeah, I'm just going to build up a replay library. If I didn't use your replay, I still have it, and I probably potentially will use it for future episodes. Please do continue sending in the replays, and I, I do appreciate everyone who has already submitted them.